Hello, if you don't know me, I am Juan in Crypto, and in this video, I'm going to show you a class that I recently gave with a Barcelona Technology School. It's an introductory class about blockchain and DeFi, decentralized finance. So I hope you enjoy it, and here's the class. This class is going to be, this session is going to be about blockchain and DeFi. I realized that I was a little bit ambitious with the content. It's, there's a lot of content, it's very detailed. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I might not be able to answer all the questions in time because of the time limit. We only have one hour and I have about 60 slides. So hopefully I'll be able to manage at least the most popular questions. Let me know please on the chat if, you're, if the sound is good, if you can see the image, if you can see my screen. Uh, let's check the chat one second. Okay, so I'm gonna wait a second. Hi, yes, perfect. Hi, Tatiana. Welcome to this special session about blockchain and DeFi. Okay, so let's start with it if everything is working well. Well, today's objectives are very simple. First is to, to learn about the main elements of the blockchain technology and the possibilities of decentralized finance. For those of you who don't know what decentralized finance is, you will see that it's one of the main uses that is currently applying or like yeah, that where blockchain technology is being applied to. So you're gonna get the main idea. It's obviously not that much into detail because we don't have much time, but still you will get a, a very good idea of what it is about. And also at the end of the session, we're gonna experience how decentralized finance actually works. We're gonna go on the blockchain and we're gonna see an example of how it works. So a little bit about the session, just so you know what we're going to see. Uh, first, we're going to see a brief introduction about the, the origin of the blockchain technology. Then we're going to see all the different elements about blockchain. Uh, we're going to experience and, and see what are the different kinds of crypto assets. We normally hear about cryptocurrencies, but today there are many more crypto assets that are not just currencies. So we're going to see each one of them. And we're going to see what smart contracts are all about. Uh, smart contracts is one of the most interesting functionalities of the blockchain technologies, or we're going to see them, uh, how they work, what, what the concept is. And then we're going to go to introduction to decentralized finance. And finally, we're going to end with the example, the exercise that I was telling you about of how decentralized finance actually work, which is amazing. So before starting the presentation, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm an industrial engineer from a university, Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. I worked for a little bit over six years in investment banking and, and the capital markets. So my background is mainly finance, like traditional finance. Then I decided, okay, I'm, I don't want to be this guy wearing tie my whole life. So I decided to move to Africa to work as a volunteer uh, for an NGO. And while working in Africa, I discovered this, this thing called mobile banking. I don't know if you know about but M-Pesa, it's a, it's a project from a company called Safaricom, where people are able to transfer money or, or value uh, on the phone. They transfer minutes, like uh, cellular, like um, mobile time. So they transfer airtime. Uh, and that opened my mind to, okay, maybe the value that we know is not necessarily uh, the only value that exists. You can actually transfer value by just sending someone airtime. And that someone can get their airtime, can pay for stuff, and can also, we can also exchange it for actual money, like fiat money, like uh, in, in Tanzania, it was, I believe, brand, I, I don't remember the name exactly. But anyway, so I did that, then I came to Europe, to London, to, I did my MBA in London Business School. While I was working there or studying there better, um, I knew I was not going back to investment banking. That's not what I wanted to do. So I started working on entrepreneurship uh, I started a company called Sportspread, nothing related with blockchain, but we were accepted into an accelerator, the Mass Challenge Accelerator, and I started to learn about blockchain. I, I, I bought a book about cryptocurrencies. I started to go into meetups, to different events, learning about blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies everywhere on podcast, Twitter, everything about it. That, that was about around the summer of 2017. And then I started working with a company in Switzerland called Swissborg. They were raising funds by issuing tokens. So we'll see a little bit more about this. It's supposed to be a utility token, which is not actually a currency. It's just a different kind of crypto asset. 
I started working with uh, Government Blockchain Association. This is more or less November 2017. Uh, the idea of this organization is to, to put together uh, companies, the government, uh, industry leaders, technology people, so that they can all share all the knowledge about the blockchain technology, how can it be used, how can it be applied, and especially for government. So how can we use this technology to improve the services to, to the citizens, to have more transparent and efficient services? So that I'm currently working in Madrid as a, the leader of this organization, the director of this organization in Madrid. I started also a YouTube channel. It's called, right now it's called Juan in Crypto, where I was just sharing my passion about this technology. I started, I didn't know what was a YouTuber. I had no idea about recording editing, but my passion about the blockchain technology brought me to start doing this. Uh, then I, all 2018, I worked with a company in Gibraltar. For those of you who don't know, Gibraltar was one of the first countries to uh, regulate the, all the cryptocurrency industry. So I started working with a company there in the Gibraltar Blockchain Exchange, which is a subsidiary entity of the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. And finally, since the last year and a half, about around a year and a half, I have been dedicated uh, probably almost like 20, no, 80 to 90% of my time to education. So I give uh, classes in, in universities such as this one, Barcelona Technology School, also some other universities here in Spain, in Colombia. I give uh, corporate trainings, workshops, uh, some meetups as well as part of the GBA. We organize a monthly meetup for free so we can teach people about how blockchain can be used in different industries. And I also have some, some online courses with, with Bitcoin. I keep on doing some regular YouTube videos and I keep on trying to spread the word about uh, Bitcoin blockchain and all this decentralized uh, future that is, is coming to us. So that's a little bit about me. Let's, let's move forward. Uh, the origin of the blockchain technology. So how did the blockchain actually started? The blockchain started with this image. It started basically in 2008 uh, when the Lehman Brothers go, went bankrupt. Uh, this was a tough times for the world. It was the financial crisis, the beginning of the financial crisis of 2008. And the problem with this crisis is that the banks were, let's say, doing some malpractices. They were issuing debt that they knew was not gonna be paid. They packaged that debt and they started selling it to institutional investors, to regular investors, even retail investors which, with money. So when the, when the whole system got collapsed because people who got that money were not paying it, almost all the financial system went down. Uh, first was Lehman Brothers, this was September 15th, and then the Federal Reserve, which is the equivalent of the, uh, the US Central Bank, so the, the guys in charge of uh, monetary policy and, and money printing, decided, okay, so in order to save the banks, the banks who were, for, in my opinion, the main responsibles of the crisis, let's, let's print some money, let's, let's buy them some assets, and that's what you can see in the graph of the bottom of the bottom right. This is the monetary base. So it's basically the money that exists in the economy. And you see that it was fairly flat until 2009. In 2009, the central bank of the US, the Federal Reserve decided, okay, let's bring money to save the banks. Let's bring money and give this money to the banks so that they can strengthen their balance sheet. So that was a problem for many, many people didn't agree with this. Many people were not really understanding why are you saving the banks who were the uh, main, who were guilty, uh, like they, they were the main responsibles of the crisis. So some people didn't like this and some people said, okay, we need a different type of currency. We need something that is different from the central banks who have control to print money. So the crisis started, as I was saying, uh, September 15, 2008. And then in October 31st, so just a month and a half later, uh, that same year, Satoshi Nakamoto came up with this white paper, which is the Bitcoin white paper. And that was the birth of the blockchain. Let's say before Bitcoin, there was no blockchain. Nobody talked about the blockchain. Nobody had mentioned that term before. So Bitcoin, as you probably know, it's a decentralized cryptocurrency. It's a cryptocurrency that works on the blockchain. Let's say that all the transactions of all the Bitcoin transactions, if I move Bitcoin from one person to another, 
they are recorded on the blockchain. And that's why the blockchain uh, gave birth with, with Bitcoin. Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? We don't know, and it really doesn't matter. It, it, that person decided to remain anonymous. He just released the white paper, and a couple of months later, in January 3rd, 2009, he decided to, okay, let's create the protocol, let's launch the protocol. But why is Bitcoin different? Why, why is it not the same as, as these central bankers uh, that are, are printing money? I argue that Bitcoin is the first digital asset. Why? Because before Bitcoin, you could have a file, you can have like any digital information, not, not assets, so this is important. Why, why I say that that's information? Because if you have a picture or a file, like let's say any file, an Excel sheet, a Google doc, a video, you can copy it, paste it and put it in another folder and have two versions of the same uh, information. You can also send it over email and still have two versions, the one that you kept and the one that you sent. You can put it on a US drive and you can, you can make multiple copies of this same information. So that's why I believe it's not an asset. Imagine if you could do that with money, if you could just copy and paste money, that, that would be ridiculous, right? Imagine if you could send money over email and then you keep the money and the person who received it has a, a, the, the money again. So that's, that's what it's called in, in technology, it's called the double spending problem. So it was before, before blockchain, before Bitcoin, it was very hard to create a system where, where you could not copy information and replicate it and have multiple versions of the same information. So with Bitcoin, Bitcoin, what, what it brought is that if you have a Bitcoin and you send it to someone, you stop having it. You, you don't have a copy of that Bitcoin, that only the other person has it. And everyone knows that the other person is, is now the owner. And if that person sends it, that person stops having it. So there's only one single version of that Bitcoin and, and you cannot replicate it. So that's why this is the first asset. It's not just information. It's, it's actually an asset that you can own and if you own it, nobody else can own it. So that's, that's the main, actually, the, the breakthrough of the blockchain technology. That was the big innovation. It was solving the double spending problem. And that came with Bitcoin. A little bit of uh, currency, cryptocurrency adoption. Today, there are multiple ATMs where you can exchange Bitcoin for, for fiat, for dollars, for euro, or you can also um, exchange fiat for Bitcoin. So you can go both ways. There's, there's this map that has, okay, can you do, uh, I, I don't understand, sorry. I had a question in the chat, but I, I don't get it. So it's, it's okay. So there's also like some different websites where you can actually check where companies that are accepting Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Uh, there's in December, no, sorry, in May 22 of 2010, there was the first commercial transaction using Bitcoin. So actually someone paid for a pizza using Bitcoin. Uh, as you can imagine, that person paid a lot of Bitcoin for one pizza. It was the first transaction. So that person paid 10,000 Bitcoin for one pizza. Today, Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin is around $6,000 per Bitcoin. So imagine that person paid around, I believe the numbers are not mistaken, $6 million or $60 million for a piece of pizza. Mm. I also more cryptocurrency adoption. Let me see, there's a question here. Uh, I don't know if you are getting it. Please let me know if I'm going too fast. If you have any questions, you know you have the chat. So go ahead and shoot. I have the, the chat here open. I'm gonna be trying to pay attention to the chat. Uh, let me know, okay? So also there are different, um, how do you say this? There are different establishments, there are different merchants that accept Bitcoin uh, and that accepts other cryptocurrencies. For example, Lamborghini currently accept Bitcoin. Obviously, they take the Bitcoin, they, they don't hold it, they sell it, they convert it into cash. But now it's, it's more starting to get more common to use it. So something that started in 2008, 2009, depending on what you consider the beginning, it can be the, the white paper uh, launched in October 31st, 2008, or the, the first block and we're going to see later what, what blocks mean. One second here. OK. So now we're going to go a little bit more into the technology. Now we saw the beginning. It started with a crisis. It started trying to solve the double spending problem. 
but, but what actually is the blockchain? What are the main elements of the blockchain? And here I have something that I found last year. It was a news uh, that I found in January last year. And it says, blockchain to improve Australian government efficiency by centralizing databases. So this headline uh, for me, it was, it was very funny because it's ridiculous. You, you are talking about a decentralized technology that is trying to centralize uh, databases. So there is not really a consensus about what the blockchain technology is. As you can Im imagine, the Australian government thinks that the blockchain is a technology that allows them to centralize databases. But here, because it's so new, the blockchain has, uh, let's say Bitcoin has 11 years since it was uh, created. The blockchain has, at, it doesn't have any more, any longer, right? So the blockchain also was built uh, 11 years ago. And there's no consensus among the industry leaders of what a blockchain is. Some people say that the only blockchain is Bitcoin because it has some special properties that it's more decentralized, that it uses a consensus algorithm, that it, it's a little bit more complicated. Some others say that no, any crypto asset that is built on a uh, decentralized database, it's a, it's a blockchain as well. Some others even say that, look, it doesn't even have to have blocks or a block of chain, uh, a chain of blocks. It can be a blockchain if it's just a distributed ledger, a distributed database. So as you see, it's not clear what a blockchain is. And I don't think we're gonna reach any an agreement anytime soon because there are conflicting interests. But let me tell you a little bit of what a blockchain is on, on my view. So before the blockchain, we had regular ledgers, right? So if you went to a store, the store, the, the person at, uh, in the store behind the counter, that person kept a record of all the transactions. And that person, many years ago, they used a, a notebook, let's say. So it's a, it's a physical ledger that is used to keep track of transactions. So that is basically a normal ledger, a standard ledger. Then with the, um, when, when personal computers starting to come to, to the world and they started to uh, popularize, then you started having digital ledgers, which the purpose was basically the same. The purpose was to have, to keep records, to have digital records of transactions. But this time you obviously kept it, as I said, digitally, you had, you had a, digital version of a ledger. So it, it, will, it allowed you to do easier calculations. It allowed you to organize the information much better. If you had mistakes, then you could go back in time and change them. And it was much more flexible. And basically humans were just using technology to keep the same ledger or keep the same record, but in a digital version. Now with the blockchain, it's basically a distributed digital ledger. So it's similar to what you could have on, on SQL or like an Excel sheet that you're using to keep track of transactions. But in this case, this ledger is distributed in multiple computers. So this same copy of the ledger that initially you could have on a, on a notebook or on an Excel sheet, on an SQL, on a regular digital database, now you have it in multiple computers where all these computers have the same version of the ledger. They all share, let's say, the same truth. So that is what a, what a blockchain is. It's, it's a ledger that is kept on multiple computers at the same time. And all these computers agree on what is the real version of the truth. So as, as you see that with, with digital ledgers, the physical ledgers didn't disappear with blockchain, nor the digital ledgers, nor the physical ledgers are gonna disappear. Blockchain is not here to replace all the ledgers. It's a very inefficient database because you have to update all the computers. You have to have multiple storage units having the same information. Uh, you have to, they have to communicate among each other. So uh, latency is very high in some cases. So this is a very useful database or, or more or less, it's a very useful ledger, but it's not gonna be implemented everywhere. You, we're gonna still have normal ledgers. We're gonna still have uh, physical ledgers. So why is it called the blockchain? Basically because it's a, it's a chain of blocks. So basically you have blocks, blocks of information, blocks of digital information that are connected one with the previous one. Each block, each new block is connected with the previous one. We're not gonna see how they are connected because that's too much detail and that would almost take the whole session. But just think that you add some information, let's say like it's like a, a page on a, on a physical ledger. You have a page of information, you fill it with transactions, then you move to the next page. 
So in this case, you add another block. You fill the new page with transactions or the new block with transactions, and then you add another page or a new block. And then you keep on adding blocks and you chain them together in order to create a, a blockchain. So what kind of information can you include on, on these blocks? Anything, any information that you want. You can add uh, transactions, you can add a uh, registry of property, you can add medical information if you want. I wouldn't recommend it, uh, but, but, but you can do it. So that is a blockchain, it's a chain of blocks. It's similar to physical ledger where you have pages and they are all chained together. You have, the, in these cases, blocks. And remember, these blocks are in multiple computers. These blocks, this, this history of the ledger, these, all these transactions are recorded in multiple computers all around the world, and they share a unique truth. They, say, they all have one single truth, which is key, because if one computer wants to cheat the system, he wants to, let's say, change some record, change some information, then all the other computers know that that's not true. No, they, they know that that's, that's false. So they can say, okay, from now on, I don't pay attention to you. You are cheating. You are sending me the wrong information. Okay, so I have a question here. Uh, Kim asks, uh, why you don't recommend to keep medical information on the blockchain? So the main reason is because medical information is personal information. Remember that this blockchain, this, this chain of blocks is in multiple computers. So if you are including medical information on the blockchain, all, it, it means that all these computers have that medical information. And you don't want your personal data to be on multiple computers. You don't want your personal data to be exposed to many people that can see that information. So that's why I don't recommend uh, including information, like medical information on the blockchain. Additionally, in, in Europe, we have the GDPR. Uh, the um, GDPR is the, I don't know the, what it means, but it's, it's basically the um, personal data protection laws, something like that. Uh, according to these laws or this regulation, you, users have the right of, um, if they want their information to be forgotten, it has to be forgotten. Once you include some information on the blockchain, knowing that all the computers have that same information, that information will be there forever. That information is considered immutable. So if you want to add personal information to an immutable database, you cannot comply with GDPR. So those are uh, like some of the reasons why I wouldn't include medical information on the blockchain. Okay, so Kuda, Kuda sorry for mispronouncing your name. Kuda Wash. Kudakwashi is saying that that applies for a public blockchain, but it wouldn't apply uh, for a private permission, permission blockchain. I'm not going to go into detail because this is an introductory class. There are different kinds of blockchains, as, uh, as Kuda is mentioning. There's public blockchains and private blockchains. But even in private blockchains, uh, they are considered to be mutable. That's, that, let's assume that that's a, a given for now. Um, if you want more detail, you can obviously ask me questions later. But in this class, we're going to leave it like that because otherwise we're not going to finish. So crypto assets, as I was telling you, Bitcoin was the first digital asset. It was the first digital asset. It's a cryptocurrency that was the beginning of the blockchain. Basically, with Bitcoin, what you have, it's, it's a digital currency that is recorded on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. So Bitcoin is more than one thing. Bitcoin is not only the currency, but it's also the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain. And this, inform this, this currency is mainly used to transfer value, to store and transfer value. That's why it's a currency, because that, those are some of the main functions of, of money. But Bitcoin was just the beginning. As you can see, there are many other crypto assets right now, and there are even more. Today, if you check this website, it's called coinmarketcap.com. You can see that there are over 2,000 crypto assets created. And, and this website, they, only, they don't have all the crypto assets. So there are many, many more. Initially, some people started to, okay, Bitcoin has a, a scalability problem. Bitcoin cannot scale too much. Bitcoin, in, in Bitcoin, you cannot make as many transactions as you would do, do per second because this, the size of the blocks is limited. It's limited to one megabyte. If you try to include too much information in, in these blocks, well, it doesn't fit. So you, you keep on adding blocks every 10 minutes and you can only fit as much information as, as the blocks support. So some people said, okay, I want to create a cryptocurrency because we are still talking about cryptocurrencies that is more scalable where you can include, make many more transactions. With Bitcoin currently, 
you can make around seven transactions per second, which is nothing. With Visa or MasterCard, you can make more than 20,000 transactions per second at their peak. When, when they are busy, they make up to 20,000 transactions per second. So some people said, okay, why don't we create these blocks in a faster period? So instead of doing it every 10 minutes, let's create it every two minutes so we can include more information. Some other people said, okay, why don't we just make the block bigger? So it's not one megabyte, but eight megabytes. So, so that way they started to create these these cryptocurrencies that are more scalable, where you can do more transactions per second. They were trying to solve this problem. Then there were some other currencies that are private currencies, private cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, as, as you probably don't know, or but you think that uh, Bitcoin is anonymous. Bitcoin is not anonymous. Bitcoin is pseudonymous. When you use Bitcoin, you are leaving a track. It doesn't have your name. It's not attached to, to your personal identity but it's attached to, to your address. If you send Bitcoin, everyone on the blockchain, because everyone has the, the, remember that this blockchain is shared in thousands of computers. So everyone can go to, the, to this ledger and check, okay, let's see which transactions have happened. So some people said, okay, I, that's a problem for me. I don't want my transactions to be public. So they created this kind of private cryptocurrencies. They use, um, it's not a technology, it's a concept called zero knowledge proofs. With, which basically uh, tried to, tries to hide who was the sender, who is the receiver, and what amount was sent. So that, that's what they are trying to do with these private cryptocurrencies. So we're still talking about cryptocurrencies. But now we move more to crypto assets, because these are not just currencies. These are platforms where you can create smart contracts. We're going to see later what are smart contracts. But basically, these different platforms allow the creation of new tokens without having to build a new blockchain. Normally if you want a, a, a new let's say to create a new asset you have to create a new blockchain so basically that meant having a new ledger to keep the records of that new asset with these kind of platforms it was super easy to create an asset on top of, a, of an existing blockchain so let's say you have the ethereum blockchain in this case so you have all the blocks of ethereum you have all the different pages or different blocks full of transactions and you can include transactions of a new asset that you created that it's only registered in this block. And that's how utility tokens started. Utility tokens are basically crypto assets that have to have a utility within an ecosystem. So I here I put some, some casino chips because a casino chip, it's a token that you can use in the casino and that has a utility in that ecosystem. In the casino, you can use these chips to bet, to gamble. Right, so that that has a utility. Another utility could be to uh, claim the entrance to a club, or to claim some uh, soda, or to ask for a service. You can use it because it has a utility. Then we started creating stable coins. Stable coins, you could say, that are also uh, cryptocurrencies because it, the the main purpose is to store and transfer value. And these stable coins. Uh, uh, yeah, let's say different from, from Bitcoin that is, is very volatile, these stable coins are supposed to be stable compared to a real life asset. In this case, I show the example of, of Tether. Tether is a crypto asset, it's a cryptocurrency that is pegged to the dollar. So basically, as you see, it fluctuates because it fluctuates in the market. In the market, some people value it for more, some people value it for less, it depends on what's happening in the market. But this asset has, has never been below $0.92 or above $1.1. So as you see, it's much less volatile than, than Bitcoin and other crypto assets. So that's another kind of, of cryptocurrency, the stable coins. Now, recently, we're starting to see uh, security tokens, which security tokens are basically securities. They are more similar to actual stocks, actual bonds, any type of actual security. But instead of registering this information in a central custodial that has a record of who owns the stocks of, let's say, Amazon, this information is stored on the blockchain. So today, how a stock works is if you have a stock, you, you, you actually have, let's say, a piece of paper or just a digital record of uh, your stock. You, you don't actually own the stock. You don't have anything, anything physical. There's a central database. There's a custodial in different countries. The name changes. There's a central entity that has all the records. It has the records of who has which stocks. There's a question scene. How is someone able to create a stable coin? Okay, let me finish these security tokens and we go back to stable coins. 
So you have this ledger, this centralized ledger of a person or, or an entity that is keeping record of who has what. If I transfer my stocks, let's say I, I transfer them to Jorge, then Jorge gets the stocks. This person, the central custodial, makes the change. Juan Pablo doesn't have the stocks anymore, now Jorge owns it. So with security tokens, it's exactly the same, but instead of having a custodial, a centralized custodial, all this information is recorded on multiple computers. So all the computers that have the blockchain keep the record of who has which stocks. So if I make a change, if I send my, my stock, my Apple stock to Jorge, every computer registers that I don't have the stocks anymore and that now Jorge is the owner of those stocks. In terms of computational resources, how expensive is it to create, a, uh, create blocks and maintenance of the chain? Well, okay, that's a question that we are not gonna answer. Sorry, Lenin, but because that's that's a very advanced question for this for this seminar, and I don't think it's relevant for most of the people. Let's go back to stablecoins. So, how can we create a stablecoin? Let's say that I'm the issuer of the stablecoin. I'm gonna create Juan Pablo coin. So I receive a hundred dollars from someone and I issue a hundred Juan Pablo coins. So I am keeping these hundred dollars as a collateral, let's say as a as they are backing the, the 100 Juan Pablo coin. So whoever has the Juan Pablo coins can always come back with the Juan Pablo coins and claim the, their dollar backs. So that's why those Juan Pablo coins are pegged to dollars because they are backed by actual dollars that I have in my bank account. So the business here is that with those dollars, Juan Pablo, that I have physical, I can, I can get some interest. I, I, get, the, I get the interest, I, I make money with the interest, that money I keep it. and the what i owe you let's say it's only you have a claim on just the hundred dollars so that's more or less how it works and the end of the session he will answer your question yeah i'll try but i don't think i will because it's as i said i was too ambitious with with the content so let's let's try to go through it and if we have time i will try to okay we also have non-fungible tokens these tokens are super interesting for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of Fungibility, uh, a fungible good is, for example, the dollar or the euro. If you have one, a $10 euro bill is the same as if you have two fives or if you have 10 $1 coins or 10 one euro coins, right? Or if you have one uh, $10 bill is the same as another $10 bill. For you, it's fungible, it's the same. Same happens with, for example, with gold. If you have a kilogram of gold, it's the same as another kilogram of gold. If it's in liquid or if it's in um, small balls, or if it's in a bar, then it's the same. It's one kilogram of gold. Those are fungibles. But in this case, for example, shells. Shells are not fungible. Each shell is different. Rocks. Rocks are not fungible. Each rock is different. It has a different size, a different color, a different weight. Uh, and this is what these tokens are. These are tokens that are different from each other. In Bitcoin, for example, if you have one Bitcoin, one Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin, or it's the same as two halves of a Bitcoin. Right? With these tokens, they are all different. And you can see here, this is a, an example that happened in, in real life. These are CryptoKitties, the ones on the top left. Uh, CryptoKitties is it's, uh, tokens that are or more, or more it are digital cats that are represented in tokens. And each of these cats is unique. They are all different. They have different hair, different ears, different color of the tail, different eye color, whatever. They are all different. On the bottom right, you can see a map, this, called, this is called Decentraland. Decentraland is a world where you have basically, think of a, of a, a landscape. No, it's not a landscape, a floor plan. Think of a plan. And then this world is divided in small uh, parcels. Each of these parcels, it's, I think it's one, it's 10 square meters. And each of these parcels is unique. If you have a token that represents one parcel, that token represents only that parcel. It doesn't represent any other parcel. And in this virtual world, each parcel has a different value because you can be close to the pharmacy and that has more value than being far from the pharmacy. Or you can be close to the main plaza or close to the parks, or you can be in the corner like just here. This token in the corner, it probably has less value because nobody is going to go to that corner. So, so these are tokens that are interesting because even though you, can, you think, oh, these are just games, yes, probably today they are just games, but these tokens can represent unique things. And we can also see it with asset-backed tokens. So asset-backed tokens are similar to stable coins in the same that they are backed by, by something stable. But in this case, they are backed by different assets. 
So for example, JP Morgan right now is working on a cryptocurrency that is backed by, on a crypto asset that is backed by gold. So it's, a, it's an asset backed token. So it's basically a token represented on the blockchain, but it, it is backed by actual uh, gold here. You can also have cars that are represented on the blockchain. You have collection of collectible cars, or you can have uh, paintings. Here you have like, for example, a Van Gogh. You have the physical Van Gogh and you say, okay, now the owner of this Van Gogh uh, is gonna be the, the one who has this token. Or you can say these 10 tokens represent the property of the Van Gogh. So whoever has one of these tokens has one tenth of this piece of art. So these are tokens that are backed by, by actual assets, by, by physical assets. Now we also have um, central bank digital currencies. This is gaining more traction, especially now with, with the crisis, with the coronavirus, uh, all the countries are scared and they are looking for solutions uh, to, to come up with this from this situation in a better position. So a lot of the central banks, a lot of the governments around the world are thinking of issuing their own currency, but just represented on a, on a distributed ledger, on a blockchain. So these, for me, are not that interesting. They are very similar to what we have today. Most of the money that we use today is actually digital. Like I, I normally don't have cash in my pockets. I just have my my cards or my phone and I can pay with that. So it's already digital. It's kept on a centralized ledger. It's the bank who knows how much I have and, and all, all my transactions. They keep record of my transactions in a centralized way. But now they want to start using this technology to, to create their own currency, but the centralized once again in multiple computers at the same time. So that is happening. Uh, Christine Lagarde, who is the president of the European Central Bank last year said, okay, this is going to happen. There, there's demand for these kind of assets, and we are going to launch ours. The, in the US, they recently said the same, like, OK, in order to prevent or mitigate the impacts of the crisis, we're going to consider uh, issuing uh, our own cryptocurrency. Uh, in, in Sweden, they are very advanced. They have done already some pilot tests. So it's happening it is all over the place. Mm. We also have corporate coins, as you see, not all of these are cryptocurrencies. They are different assets, right? So with these corporate coins, it's similar. Uh, so Kodak wanted to create a crypto asset. So for, for content creators, JP Morgan actually launched their own cryptocurrency to stop using the SWIFT system when, when they want to send money across different offices. For example, JP Morgan wanted to send, JP Morgan New York wanted to send money to JP Morgan uh, Hong Kong. So that normally, if they use the traditional banking system, it takes time and it's expensive. Now with their own cryptocurrency, they just send it and, and it's value transfer. And more recently, we have seen the case of, of Libra. Facebook wants to launch its own cryptocurrency. Well, it's own with, with some friends. It's, it's a group of people. But now corporates are getting into this space. And also, unfortunately, we have the scam coins. Basically, these are scams that are using the technology to hide and to take advantage of all the hype. But they are basically pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes, scams. You need to be very careful. Never that I have said before, it's investment advice. I wouldn't advise you to buy any of the assets that I have mentioned. This is just educational. And especially if you are really trying to start to invest or something, you have to pay close attention because a lot of the coins that have been issued are worthless. And a lot of those worthless coins are basically just out uh, They are just scams. So you need to be careful. Okay, so we're going fast. I think we're gonna make it in time. Once again, if you have questions, try to ask them if they are relevant to the topic, I will try to answer them. If they are too advanced, I would love to spend more time with you, but, but I'm sorry, we are restricted in that sense. So I won't be able to answer all the questions. So smart contracts, remember that we talked, I'm gonna go back here for a second. I'm gonna show you. Remember that we talked about these platforms that allow to do smart contracts, right? So what are smart contracts? I found this analogy that a smart contract is similar to a vending machine. How, why are they similar? In, on a vending machine, if you give the right instructions, if you say, if you put the coins and you press A1, you will get this, this chip right now, right? It, it automatically executes those instructions. So the smart contracts is basically, uh, it works like a vending machine. It doesn't need any outsider to tell it what to do. You just give the instructions and the smart contract executes itself automatically. So what is smart contract? Smart contract, once again, it, it's code. It's code written on the blockchain. It's code that is written on multiple computers. 
this code just follows the instructions. If something happens, if I get these instructions, in the, in the case of the vending machine, if I get the money, if I get the exact change, and I press A1, then something happens. Then it executes itself. Uh, they are self-executing, as I said, they don't need intervention from, from outsiders, and they are secure if written collect, uh, correctly. And this is a big if, because a lot of the smart contracts that have been written before have bugs, because this is, this is code, this is programming code. And this is code that once you write, it's on the blockchain, and it's in multiple computers, and it's going to be there forever. So if you write code with a mistake, and you launch it, and you write it, and you print it, let's say, on the blockchain, you, you register this on, on a ledger, then it's going to be there forever with the mistake that you had. So you need to be very careful when writing smart contracts. As I said, so initially we had these blocks of transactions. This is the blockchain. You remember blocks of information. The smart contract goes here as, as a transaction. You Instead of writing, Juan Pablo is sending X Ethereum or X Ether to Jorge, Maria is sending it to Ana, whatever. Like You have the smart contract. You have the code. If Juan Pablo sends this money, then something happens. That is what a smart contract is. It's code written on the blockchain, uh, replicated in multiple computers. Once again, these, like all the computers have exactly the same code. So if the conditions happen, if the instructions uh, happen exactly as they were written, then the code executes itself. That, that's a smart contract. And we're gonna see an example. This is a very basic example. So let's say we want to do, we want to gamble. We want to do a bet. We are basically flipping a coin. In this case, Alan contributes five ether and Mary contributes five ether to a smart contract. So they send this money to this piece of code written on the blockchain. Then the smart contract just flips the coin. That's the instructions it has. If I receive money from Alan and money from Maria or Mary in this case, I just flip a coin. If the coin hits tails, I send the 10 ether to Alan. If it hits heads, then I send nothing to Alan. On the other hand, if it hits heads, it sends 10 ether to Maria. And if it hits uh, tails, then it doesn't send anything to Maria or to Alan, right? So today, if you want to do something like this, you would need to, to trust each other. You would need to, okay, let's flip a coin, uh, but someone needs to have the money or, or otherwise, uh, basically, if Alan loses, he can run away with the money. Or you need to trust the custodial. You need to trust an entity that is going to keep Alan's money and Mary's money. And then when that entity flips the coin, that is same entity, that centralized entity is the one that is giving the money to the winner. But with this, with the blockchain and with smart contracts, you can do it in a decentralized way where you don't have to trust anyone. You just read the code. If you know how to read the code, if the code is well written, you know that the money is going to go to whoever wins this bet. So that's just a basic example of how you can use smart contracts. It's code. You just have to trust the code. And if the code gets the right instructions, if this happens, then it executes itself. OK, now we enter DeFi. This is when it becomes more interesting, because this is, this is actually how we are applying blockchain technology to decentralized finance. Decentralized finance is, uh, well, we'll see what decentralized finance is. So today, and, and since a long time ago, we have been using traditional finance, right? So we have these big centralized institutions that we all trust, that are in charge of managing our money, that are intermediaries, and that played a very important role in history because they, they were used to connect people who had um, excess of money with people who, had, who needed money. So, so banks, if you give your money to the bank, they keep it for you. They lend that money to someone else who needs that money and they get some interest, right? They, they, they intermediate that relationship. And they, they worked fine until uh, like some years ago, but they, they started to, to become updated, uh, outdated. Uh, they are inefficient, they are slow, they, they cannot innovate that easily, also because they have a lot of regulation. So after these traditional financial institutions, all these big banks, big structures that we have today, we started to see something that is the fintech, all these fintech that uh, companies that basically they wanted to provide some of the services that were initially provided by banks, but in a much more efficient way. So basically you just, if you have, um, if you want to open a bank account, then you can just do it online. You just have your phone, send a picture of your passport or your ID, and then you can create your own account. 
Also, uh, these companies are much more flexible because they don't have all the regulation doesn't apply to them and they are not trying to, to do everything. Like normally banks, they have an investment bank, they have uh, corporate clients, personal cl clients, they offer bank, uh, bank accounts, credit, credit cards, etc. They offer a lot of services. These fintechs are much more flexible and fast and innovative because they can they can focus on just one service. They say, let's say, I just want to offer uh, credit com credit cards or bank accounts or whatever. They can focus and they are much more flexible on the on the touch of your hand. You can use these these apps, these these fintechs. And now we're trying to see decentralized finance. That is something that it's very hard to understand. It's it's a lot of complex things. There's no central entity in charge of anything. It's just it's just a lot of interconnections happening. And we're gonna see this in a little bit more detail later. So how did decentralized finance begin? Same, we go back to Bitcoin. Basically the blockchain and everything related to the blockchain, you have to go back to Bitcoin. You have to understand Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin allowed us to transfer money without having to trust any central party. Without, if, if today, or let, let's say if 15 years ago, I wanted to send, to send money to my brother in Colombia and right now in Madrid, I had to go through the banking system. It takes three days, they charge, they, they, it cost me money. Imagine if it was on a Friday, then the money would take like five days because banks obviously, they don't work on Saturdays, they don't work on Sundays. They, if it was a holiday, then it was worse. They don't work, they don't work on Mondays. Let's say that I tried to send the money at night. Well, it didn't work. It was, it was a pain, it's very complicated. And if the bank said, okay, Juan Pablo, I want you to prove where your funds come from. And I'm like, my, my brother needs this money now. I, I don't have time to prove where my funds come from. I have them and I want to send them, that's it. So before it was relatively hard and it took time. With Bitcoin, you could do this without any intervention, without any intermediary. You just type some address, send, and the Bitcoin are in my brother's address in a couple of minutes. So that is why decentralized finance is so powerful because it's decentralized. No one can control what happens and you, can, you are free to do whatever you want with your assets. So once Bitcoin brought this, this kind of new thing where you could store wealth in a decentralized way, you can, you can start storing wealth without having to go to a bank. You can transfer money without having to open a, a bank account, transfer value without opening a bank account. Then this, this whole movement started. And now we have lots of projects. We have projects, as you can see here, in payments, you have different infrastructure that you need to use. You have even KYC, like the, all these know your client policies that you need to follow. You can do them right now in a decentralized way. You have stable coins. As I said, we, we already talked about stable coins. They are part of decentralized finance because some are a little bit centralized in the sense that uh, if I issue uh, this Juan Pablo coin, remember I issued 100 Juan Pablo coins and I'm the one keeping $100 backing those uh, 100 Juan Pablo coins. There are some new currencies that are, are decentralized, that no one is keeping those dollars. That is, it's a smart contract that is keeping the collateral. So, so that is very interesting. And we have basically, it's a, it's a whole ecosystem. It's, it's, it's an industry in itself. So that's what we have today with, with the centralized finance. Here I'm showing you a little bit of the, the main DeFi projects. DeFi is decentralized finance. Uh, we have MakerDAO, which is huge. Right now it's, it represents around 50 to 60% of the whole ecosystem. This is a, a project that basically does lending, decentralized lending. So today you don't have to go to a central institution to ask for a loan. We'll see it has some conditions. We'll, we'll see them in detail. You have also derivatives. You can create uh, a derivative. Basically a stable coin is a derivative. It's a derivative of the, the, the stable asset, the, the pegged asset that you are using. And you have all these projects and as you can see, most of these projects are built in Ethereum. Only one, only you have to go to the project number 12 in order to go to a, a project built in Bitcoin. And what is the most amazing about this space is that it moves so fast. So this is a picture of the space in November, 2018. You have three projects basically, or four projects. They have some connections. So there are some interactions among them. And only six months later, six months later you have many more projects. Now you don't have only four, but you have more projects. You have many more interactions, so more people are using them and you have more connections, right? And this is May, 2019. And if we go forward, if we move just four months to August, 2019, 
now you see that this is chaos. These are many more projects. Once again, they don't have to ask for any permission to just create a new project. You can start using any of these projects without asking permission to the owner. This is completely decentralized. You can just start participating. You can create a new project. Most of this code is open source. So you can just go copy some code, make some changes if you believe you can improve it, and then launch a new protocol. And this is the pace of decentralized uh, finance. So in less than a year, you, go, you went from this to this, which is, which is just crazy. So what are the, some of the examples of the things that you can do with decentralized finance? Before, before the blockchain and before decentralized finance, exchanges, you always, in order to exchange some asset, you always needed to go to a centralized entity. Once again, there is this centralized entity that has the records of who has what. If you want to, let's say, sell some stocks, that, that centralized record is the one that is keeping, okay, Juan Pablo sold these stocks, now they belong to Mary, right? With the centralized finance, you, you don't have that centralized custodial. You can just exchange funds with using a smart contract. So basically how it works is if I send money, if I send my Apple stocks to the smart contract and the smart contract receives the, the money equivalent for, for those Apple stocks, then the smart contracts give the person who send the money the stocks and gives me who sent the, sto the stocks, sends me the money. So this happens in a decentralized way. So I don't have to trust anyone but the code. I need to make sure that the code is well written because otherwise I can just send my stocks and if there's a bug, if there's a, an error in the code, I can lose my stocks. But that, this is some of the things that you can start doing without trusting anyone, just the code. So you can do that not today. Also, you have decentralized savings. Today, if you have some excess cash, like if, let's say if you have dollars, you go to, you open a bank account, you deposit your bank account. Well, today you get 0% interest or negative in some cases. But before, let's say five years ago, you, you open a savings account and you could store value and, and then start claiming some interest, right? In a, in a centralized way, there's, there's a, a company, there's a bank, or there's a whatever, a financial institution that is holding your cash. With the blockchain, with the centralized finance, you can store your assets on a smart contract and start generating uh, interest from that smart contract. And then when you want to withdraw it, you just withdraw it and you, got, you have more. In a decentralized way, you don't, this way, you don't have to trust this bank, this custodial institution, you have to trust the code. You need to trust that the code is well written. And also you have the centralized loans. And we're gonna see a little bit more detail how it works. But basically today, or like once again, five years ago, if you wanted to get a loan, you had to go to a bank, uh, it, it's a complicated process, prove your identity, uh, prove that you're gonna pay it, that you have the funds or the, the cash flows to pay for that loan. With the blockchain, with the centralized loans, you can go to a smart contract and say, okay, smart contract, hi, I need some, some money. Can I give you this asset so you can keep it and, and, give, and lend me money? You can do that today. With the centralized finance, we have the centralized lottery where nobody loses. This is super interesting. So let's say you have three people here on the, on the left. They deposit some money. This is, this is DAI, which is a stable coin. It's, it's basically, let's, let's assume for the case being that this is $1. So each of these three people contribute $1 to a smart contract. The smart contract, what it does is that it uses one of these uh, savings protocols. So it puts these $3 to, to get interest. And at the end of some period, let's say at the end of a month, it distributes every one of the participants get, gets their dollar back. And one of them, the winner, gets the interest that, that these dollars were making in the smart contract. So you have a lottery because it's randomly, someone is gonna get the interest, but all the others, they get their dollar back. You have the chance of getting the interest. So this is super interesting. And this is something that you can only do with the centralized finance. You could also potentially do it with a bank, but it's more complicated. I'm sure that regulatory wise, it's, it's tricky to say, okay, bank, you have all this money from all these different people, you get interest and only one of these people are, one of these persons are gonna get that money back at the end. That, that is, believe me, that, that sounds very tricky because it is tricky. Okay, going back to decentralized loans. Remember I was telling you that we are gonna explore this in much more detail. So the, there is this project called the MakerDAO where you can send some assets to a smart contract as a collateral. So the smart contract is gonna keep your assets safe and in exchange for keeping your assets safe, the smart contract is gonna give you a loan in dollars. Once again, let's assume that this, 
this digital uh, stable coin is its, its dollars. So then you can go spend your dollars, buy more Ethereum, buy a house, buy a car, whatever you want to do with those dollars. And once you go back and pay them, um, the smart contract releases your collateral. So let's, let's here have an example. So you have in this case, first, the assumption is that one Ether, which is the currency of Ethereum, is worth $150. So in this case, you go to a smart contract, you send one Ether, and you receive 50 DAI. So in this case, the collateral is 300%. So you're sending an Ether that is worth $150, and you're receiving only $50 as a loan. So you can do whatever you want with those $50. And then once you go back and pay the $50, with some interest, you, you get your Ethereum back, you get your Ether back. So it's similar to, uh, how do you call this? These, these places where you go and let's say you have a watch and you need, you need cash, you need cash, cash urgently. So you can go to this place, give your watch, get some money, get a loan that is guaranteed that, that, uh, by your watch. So the, the watch in this case is the collateral. And then when you go back and pay that loan, you get your, your watch back. So that is something that you can do today with the centralized finance without having to open a bank account, without proving your identity, without doing anything. So, so for people who, for example, are foreign years who go to a new city and they don't have a passport, they don't have anything, they, they are just, for example, all these refugees, they can ask for a loan if they have some property that they can put as collateral. This is tricky, it, it, sometimes it's hard to understand, but I'm gonna show you now in practice something that we can do with it with decentralized finance because we're approaching the end of the session and the timing was just right so now i'm going to show you how a decentralized uh, exchange actually work this is going to be tricky it's a live example normally they don't go well but i'm willing to take the risk for you please let me know if you are seeing my screen i'm not sure if you see my screen here please on the chat someone help me um, I just opened a, a browser, Chrome browser. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you, Juan. Okay, so let, we're gonna go to Uniswap, Uniswap Exchange. And basically here, what we're gonna do is exchange some assets for another one in a decentralized way without anyone uh, knowing, without using a central counterparty. So now here I'm gonna connect uh, this website to my wallet. I believe you won't be able to see this. Let me, give me a second. All right, how do I see this? Okay, now it's opening. So this is a, a wallet that I have installed in my browser. I need to change my account. I will go to this account. Okay. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this decentralized exchange to exchange some of my ether, my the, the, the currency of Ethereum. So I'm gonna change 0 0.05, let's say ether. And I'm gonna select a token. So what do I want to exchange it for? In this case, I'm gonna use MakerDAO. Let's say I want some MakerDAO. It will give me 0 0.0255 MakerDAO. And I want to make the change. It opened a, another window in a different wallet, in a, in a different, computer screen. So I just need to accept. It's asking me, okay, this is gonna cost you 0 0.00092, whatever. I confirm. Now it's taking some time. So what's happening right now is that I'm, I'm sending Ether to a smart contract and that smart contract is gonna give me back MakerDAO. Okay, I have a question here from Catherine. Uh, for the central line loan, the interest is higher or lower than banks? Okay, so uh, we're gonna go back to to the slide because I, I can show you the interest rates. It's normally lower. It's normally lower than banks. And for a smart, uh, for a decentralized saving account, it's it's normally higher than banks. So it's actually quite beneficial because the spread is very low, and we will see that. Okay. So in this moment, if you can see here, the transaction is happening. So basically. Um, I'm sending this information to the blockchain. All these computers are processing that information, are getting, okay, Juan Pablo is, or not Juan Pablo, but this address that is here is sending some ether, uh, is receiving the, the one that ether in exchange for MakerDAO. We can see here, I want, to, I want to see, okay, the transaction is confirmed. 
And wh what we can do is go to the blockchain and see the transaction, see the transaction happening. So this is this is part of a block. This is the actual blockchain. So uh, this is the transaction hash, the, the, I, the ID of the transaction. And you can see here that I sent from my address to the, the smart contract that I was telling you about this contract. I sent some ether and received some maker. This is the cost of the transaction. And now I hope you can see my screen. Uh, I know you can see my screen, but I don't know if you can see this, this wallet that opened. I can see here that the transaction was, was confirmed. And if I go to my assets, you can see that I now have some, some maker DAO. Okay, awesome. So this is it. This is one hour sharp. It's 12 o'clock. So please let me know if you have more questions. We have, I, I would say, a couple of minutes to answer uh, some of your questions. Um, if you don't have questions, I can go back to the previous ones, to the ones that I said that were complicated and go and answer those. I'm gonna wait 10 seconds. If nothing shows up, I'll go back to the others. Oh, I see, there's a question here. Could you further explain the difference between blockchain protocol and platform? It, it's actually, I would say it's a, it's a language uh, difference. It's, it's a semantic difference. Uh, I, I, can, I sometimes use protocol or platform interchangeable. Like I can use either platform or protocol depending on what it means. A protocol in theory, it, it's, it's wider. Like let's say the, the Bitcoin, you have the Bitcoin protocol and you can build a platform on top of that protocol. But some people can also say the Bitcoin platform. So it's, it, there's not really, it's, it's a semantic difference. Uh, thanks, Inigo, for, for asking that. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the previous questions. I remember there were, in terms of computational resources, how expensive is it to create blocks and maintenance of the chain? Okay, so the, the people who are creating new blocks, who are adding new, new pages or new blocks to this blockchain, remember that the blockchain is a, it's a ledger. Instead of pages, you have blocks. There are some people that are adding these blocks. In order to add a new block, let's talk about, for example, the, the Bitcoin blockchain to use to use a clear. Let, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing the screen so you can see me uh, full screen. I believe you should see me full screen right now. Uh, so there are thousands, if not millions, actually, there are millions of computers all around the world trying to add the new block. So it's in energy consumption is really, really expensive to add new blocks. Uh, people or, or like computers who add new blocks in this moment are getting rewarded with Bitcoin. More or less, uh, no, actually today they are getting 12.5 Bitcoin per block. So at the price of Bitcoin, let's say, let's make a, to, to make the number simple, Bitcoin is worth right now 7,000. And let's say that that 12.5 is not 12.5, but 10. So you are making 70,000 per block. So what that tells you is that there are $70,000 of energy being spent uh, every 10 minutes on the blockchain just to add a new block. Obviously, you can do this much more efficiently. You don't have to use the same consensus algorithm as, as Bitcoin. The, the consensus algorithm is the way that you make sure that all the computers have the same information. So you don't have to use this proof of work. You can say, OK, every time that we want to add more information, we just go to Juan Pablo and Juan Pablo approves it, and then it becomes part of the ledger. So that is much cheaper. Also, it depends on how decentralized you want the, this, this blockchain to be. If you want 100 computers to have the, the blockchain, the, this, this registry, this ledger, then you only need to 100 units of storage. But if you want 1,000, then you need 1,000 units of storage, of storage. Today, Bitcoin has more than 100,000 nodes, 100,000 computers storing this database. So you need 100,000 storage units that are storing this, this database. So the answer is not clear uh, because it depends a lot on, on the software that you're using, the objective that you want to use, what, what's the purpose of using the blockchain. And that obviously makes a huge difference in terms of, of uh, expenses, uh, time and money. Let's see, uh, I lost the chat now. Let's see if I find it, invite chat. So that was one question. Let's see, I have the chat here. Two new messages. Okay, what are the interesting blockchain projects that you're personally excited about? 
I am personally excited about decentralized finance. Uh, Uniswap is very interesting. The fact that because you, you don't have a counterparty, like you, you are exchanging tokens with a, with a pool of tokens. Let's say Uniswap, how it works is Uniswap, the protocol or the, or the platform has different assets. It has Ether, it has DAI, it has Maker, which was the one that we just bought. And if you want to exchange, if you want one of these tokens, you just send, send the smart contract something and it sends you back something. That for me is super interesting. The, the lending protocols, every, everything around DeFi, for me, it's, it's very interesting right now. Uh, and one question from JL. All the smart contracts are programmed in the same language, Solidity? No. So in, in Ethereum, if you want to create a smart contract in Ethereum, you use a programming language called Solidity, which is basically all these instructions, if this happens, then that something happens. This, has, this is written, is not written in, in, in English or in Spanish or in a human comprehensible language. It's written in a programming language. So Ethereum uses Solidity. For example, in Bitcoin, you can use, you can also write some less complicated contracts, but you have to use the script language. And some different platforms have different languages. You can even program in C++. Uh, some languages are gonna allow you to program in, in Go. So it depends. It depends on the on the blockchain. But you can use different uh, computer uh, like programming languages to write smart contracts or or DApps, which are decentralized applications. Basically, it's a combination of smart contracts, and you can actually build a an actual DApp. In in which case, the interface is is very similar. The interface, what what the user sees, is very similar. But all the backend, all the logic is running on the blockchain. Okay, so I think that's it for today. Thank you very much for for being here. I hope I know it was a lot of content for for those of you who are not new to this technology. Your head is probably about to explode because we, as I, as I said from the beginning, I was very ambitious. I tried to give you as much for information as I could. We even went a little bit over the hour. Uh, so well, once again, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank. Okay, Joseph, you said thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you are more interested about this, well, you, you know that you can ask me directly. My email is Juan at Juan in Crypto with with uh, with Latin I uh, dot com, or you can contact uh, Barcelona uh, Technology School, and I'm sure that they will be able also to connect you with me or to solve your questions directly. Have a great day and well, looking forward to see you in some other opportunity. Bye. Well, that's it for this video. I hope you really liked it. I hope you enjoyed it. And most importantly, I hope you learned a lot. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. That's important for me. It's important for the channel. If you didn't like it, well, I'm sorry, but also you can also hit the thumbs down. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button so you can get all the notifications of the new videos of this channel. That's it for me. I'm gonna leave you with some other videos here and please subscribe to the channel here. Bye.